What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's a 1965 classic by Hal David and Burt Bacharach, and it's a reoccurring theme through like decades of popular culture. Apparently, all you need is love. And the idea is that if we can just sow in a little bit of kindness and compassion, then everything will be beautiful and lovely and butterflies, that we can have the dream of a world in union, that we can teach it to sing in perfect harmony, as long as we can like run together over hills with bottles of Diet Coke in our hands at the same time but the problem is it's never really worked out too well has it i mean let's be honest hatred and division and suspicion and murderous rage still exist in our society and even in ourselves and no matter how far we're prepared to go for this dream how far we're prepared to call for it or sing for it or even fight for it i mean that's ironic isn't it that we're often prepared to destroy for this dream that at the same time that society calls for love and tolerance and acceptance it will also set out to destroy and cancel any conflicting opinion anything deemed to be a threat to itself like the idea is love everyone except for the haters <laughs> like call out and marginalize and shame the haters hate the haters i mean do we not see the problem with this guys like to hate the haters is to become the hater. Now, I'm not excusing people that are hateful towards others in their actions or their language. Rather, I'm trying to point out that this is a problem that is common to all of us. That, you know, the same people that cried out a joyful kind of Hosanna one week were also crying out, crucify him the following week. You know, it's easy to love and to enjoy people when we agree and when they do what we want them to do or what we expect of them. But how quickly we shift when our stuff is threatened, our comfort, our security, our value, our sense of self-worth, our views or opinions. Uh, and the problem is that there is one ingredient that keeps conflicting with the utopia idea and that ingredient is self. Self-interest, self-protection, self-ambition, selfishness. It is sin. So just pause a second. What does the world need right now? Yes, it needs love, but ours is flawed. It's insufficient, it's incapable, it's fickle and fragile. What does the world really need now? It needs God's love through the son that he beloved but gave for the world that he so loved. We desperately need to hook in to God's love. The world needs Jesus. It's always needed Jesus. His healing, his restoring, his rescuing. Only he can deal with the sin and with the self issue in us and in our society. The world needs the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. And how is the world to find that? How is it to see it or hear it or receive it? Well, that is through the church. The body of Christ, the local church, is the hope of the community. That is you and that is me. Our town needs a church that is healthy, visible, vocal and active and united together so that it may reveal Christ to the town and therefore so bring hope to the town. This is something that I really feel God has been impressing upon to our hearts recently, that we continue to grow into the shoes that are the readiness of the gospel of peace. Now, two weeks ago, I spoke a message around rereading 2 Chronicles 7, 14. You know the verse, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Now, I'm, I'm not going to restate that, that message now. I'm not going to go back over that passage. And if you missed it, you can catch up on our various platforms. But, but there are a couple of points that are really singing out to me that are really particular for this season. And I think they need a deeper look. Because the thing is, the church doesn't need a discreet discussion group. It doesn't need a shy religious community. It doesn't need a timid example of like cultural tradition or a bunch of people who are really nice but kind of keep themselves to themselves. The, the town right now needs a church that is present and active and vocal and loving and compassionate and filled with 
power. And the jump off point for all of that is humility. You know, we cannot pray with integrity and experience the power of prayer without humility. That is submission to God and to each other. So good morning. My name is Tom. Welcome to Riverview Church Online. Let's jump right into this now. And humility, it is a big deal to God. It is a massive theme in scripture. Micah tells us that alongside acting justly and loving mercy, walking in humility with God is a must. It is a requirement. James tells us that we need to submit ourselves to God and humble ourselves before him in order that he may draw near to us and lift us. And this requires that we wash sinful hands and that we purify sinful hearts. You know, without humility, neither church nor believer can truly mature or be healthy. In fact, it's impossible to please God without it. Now, I know some of you may well be thinking that I've misquoted Hebrews 11.6, which says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. But just think about it a second. Faith is impossible without humility, because by definition, faith is looking beyond ourselves for help and for support, rescue and salvation and strength. Faith is recognising that I am not enough and saying I need you, Jesus. And then the outworking in our lives of walking humbly with God is that we live in humility towards each other. Peter says, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And Paul says that we need to do this in order to walk in a worthy manner, a manner worthy of our calling. He's kind of implying that we cannot walk worthily without employing humility. That's just a couple of kind of thematic examples for you. So humility, we we know we need it, right? We know that God calls for it. We know that we should do it. But but what? I mean, the strange thing is that despite the many references and teachings within scripture, humility seems to still bamboozle us, elude us, mystify us, and we keep getting it so wrong. Now, here are two things that I think are often true. Firstly, skilled, clever and wise people who are genuinely humble are often accused of arrogance and pride. People misunderstand. But on the flip side, also arrogant, self-seeking people who practice false humility deliberately can often be championed as like great examples of humility in our midst. So we need to get to grips with this. And before we look at our text today, let's look at a couple of kind of misunderstandings, misconceptions uh, about humility. And I want to present this in three different characters and honestly I promise you I can recognize myself in all three of them. The first character is this, the self-deprecator. This this person speaks themselves down, they talk themselves down, they say things like oh I'm no good really, or I'm, I'm rubbish, or I'm not as good as you know that guy down there. They, they might do a job or, or whatever out of a warped sense of duty or or because there's nobody else to do it. So, you know, there's nobody wanting to do it. So if I don't do it, nobody will. So they kind of feel they have to dive in. And then they often berate themselves for not being better at that thing. But also they'll berate themselves for not, uh, if they're too pleased with what they've done, if they look at a job well done and feel good about that, they'll still berate themselves. If they're applauded for something, they'll quickly defer. Like, oh, it, it was nothing. It was nothing. It wasn't me. You know, and the common one is so that people say it wasn't me it was the Lord you know it wasn't me preaching it was the Lord well this is me preaching to you today now I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that he speaks to you through this but this is me speaking to you right now you know that that kind of thinking isn't genuine humility it's it's either a lack of confidence 
or its insincerity. The, the self-deprecator either thinks and believes that they're genuinely like miserably rubbish and unworthy, or they actually kind of secretly think they're pretty decent, like they think they're a living legend but must compensate for that somehow by talking down about themselves. That is not humility. But then similarly, the second character is the skill concealer. Now, this person may well have developed skills and gifts and abilities, and they recognise that they're good at these things, but they believe that humility means they should just hide all of those skills and abilities, even when they can, what, what they can bring is required and useful and would even be beneficial to people around them. You know, the skill concealer says, uh, I should hold back. I, I should let someone else have a go. You know, maybe I'll, I'll stay silent until everybody else has shared their thoughts and ideas and they do this either from a generally good place a good heart thinking you know we don't want to offend or belittle or threaten or push out or discourage others uh, perhaps you know they might consider others to be less skilled or less confident and so they want to give them a chance or the other way that this happens is that they think pridefully they consider themselves better and they don't want to associate with others who are less able than them. And for whatever of those two reasons, they conceal what they really have. They, they may seem to champion or prioritise others. And you know, the thing is, it's actually possible to be pridefully humble. Like if you make a great point of how you honour other people, how wonderfully inclusive you are, look at how I, I, I consider everybody else first, that can actually be a source of pride for us. But on the flip side, sometimes putting ourselves forward for something is the humble thing to do. I mean, consider that for a second. Uh, and then the third character is the, the can-doer, okay? Now, this person takes a very literal view of I can do all things. They, they really want to see things moving forward. They're passionate, they're enthusiastic, they're resourceful, they're even sacrificial. You know, they see a need, they see a gap, a niche, and they go fill it. They have a strong sense of calling. And they understand that humility isn't about self-deprecation or concealment but that the believer is supposed to shine brightly and obviously in the world. So they understand that we're not given a, a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power and of love, which tend to be massive strengths for these kinds of people, but sometimes they skip ahead of a sound mind, right? And, and perhaps, like me, on so many occasions will speak or act before really thinking or praying or waiting for God to move us. That they often set out from I can do, but arrive at I should do. And sometimes without realising it on that path, they elbow other people out of the way or fill positions or roles that were never meant for them in the first place. And here's the thing, if we run ahead of God, if we get carried away, if, if we edge our way into a place that God never intended for us, or if we stay in a position one moment longer than God has planned, then it's really bad for everybody. So here we are. Humility, right? Where do we go with this? Well, let's turn to Philippians 2 in your Bibles and let's start with the first four verses this morning. It says, therefore, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. You know, Paul implores us to behave in a particular way towards each other in regard to and in relationship with one another like motivated by some pretty significant points, being encouraged by the nature of our unity with Christ, that, that thing that binds us and uh, first and foremost, and, and also being comforted by his powerful love. He, he's saying, if your faith in Christ is genuine, 
if your relationship to him is authentic, then you must be like-minded, have the same love, be one in spirit and in mind. And then this leads to some pretty clear applications. Don't act out of selfish ambition or out of vain conceit. I mean, selfish ambition, the, the Greek word for that is erethia. Uh, which means self-seeking, faction, contention, rivalry, like seeking followers by means of gifts. And then vain conceit is conodoxia. It, it talks about vain glory or vainly glorifying within ourselves. In other words, what he's saying is don't promote yourself. Don't tell everyone else what a great job that you've done or what a great person you are. Now, honestly, there's, there's little that grates with me more than seeing somebody put out like a big signpost saying, look at me, look at what I can do, look at how good I am, look at how great I am, look at what I've done, go me. But the problem is my aversion to that is never stronger than when I see that or hear that within myself. It literally makes me feel sick within myself when I do it. Paul's also saying, like, don't stir things up, don't manipulate, don't engineer for your, for your own enjoyment or your own benefit. Don't be divisive amongst each other. Don't consider other people to be a threat to you, like non-physically, obviously. Don't be paranoid about what other people are thinking. You know, they only actually threaten your ego. And don't focus on followers or, or numbers that make your church or your ministry or your life look good and popular. There are some churches, some ministries that are built upon selfish ambition that are about numbers and, and reputation. But as Paul previously mentioned in the first chapter of Philippians, these people were, were preaching from a position of envy and selfish ambition. I mean, he still rejoices. Christ is still preached, but it's not from a good place. And, and the thing I think you, we really need to figure here is that this does not mean that we shouldn't volunteer ourselves or that we shouldn't put ourselves forward. You know, we shouldn't be falsely humble. The church shouldn't grow numerically. You know, that's all good, but it's all about the heart. It's all about our motives. And then the next thing that Paul says, so that's the don'ts, but he says, instead, value others above yourself. Like, don't serve to look after only your own interests, but also the interests of others. Each other's needs to prefer, honouring each other, uh, other over ourselves. You know, it's not wrong to put food in your mouth or to buy things for your comfort to enjoy the wonderful things that we have available in this world that is not wrong but don't hoard it to yourself don't safeguard it only to your own don't ignore a hungry person at your table or at your door now all of this sounds pretty sensible and reasonable right i mean i think even a secular society would agree with at least some of what paul's been saying there but this is where it gets tougher right here where paul is talking about valuing others above ourselves because he's saying count other people more significant than you Honour them above yourself. Prioritise them above yourself. Value their life more highly than yours. What he's suggesting is that we entirely change the direction of our attention. Stop looking at ourselves. Stop looking out for ourselves. Stop protecting our own interests. Stop prioritising like you and yours and look outwards from that. And now he really drops a bombshell. He says, this is the mind to arm yourself with the attitude of Christ. Verse five, he says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You know, humility 
is it's neither about an inflated nor a deflated view or opinion of ourselves. In fact, humility is not a focus on ourselves at all. Rather, it's a focus upon God first and foremost. Now, what can we know from the humility that Jesus demonstrates in his example? He knew exactly who he was and yet did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Jesus demonstrates true humility in his focus on and submission and obedience to the Father. His focus is not on himself at all, but upon Father God. And you know, there's nothing soft or timid or reserved or wimpy about Jesus's humility. This is the King of Kings going to the cross of shame. And that is the mindset that we are called to hold. Regardless of how great I am or consider myself to be, I am to serve you. Regardless of how much I value myself and my stuff, I'm called to value you more highly. Regardless of who I am, I, I, I'm meant to sacrifice myself for you, like a drink offering poured out for you, even if you despise me, even if you mock me, even if you demean me, even if you abuse me, even if you say wicked things about me, and even if you hurt me, I am meant to be sacrificial towards you because that is to have the same mindset, the same attitude as Christ. In all of this, I am to humbly and obediently serve God, even if that leads me to a type of personal Gethsemane. You know, there's nothing soft or, or timid or reserved or wimpy about humility. This is tough stuff. In, in fact, it's so tough that it's not even possible. <laughs> Wait, pause a second. What am I saying? It's not even possible for us to pursue that kind of uh, humility, not within ourselves, but remember with God, nothing is impossible. The only way that we can arm ourselves with the same mindset of Christ, have the same attitude of Christ, is by having the Spirit of Christ in us. The Spirit that raised him in power and authority in us. But thank God he gives his Spirit to us in abundance. So humility is about submission and obedience to God. Here I am, Lord. Like whatever you want that you may be glorified, it is all about you, Jesus. Lord, forgive us for so often making this about us, about me, about ourselves. You know, for, uh, humility is recognising that I am not God's gift to the church. But Jesus is God's gift to the world through me and through you. You're not God's gift to the church. Jesus is, but he comes through you. So, so instead of humility being about hiding who we are, it's actually about revealing who he is in us. Humility is understanding, accepting and submitting to our true identity, Christ in you, the hope of glory. We are servants and children of the living God, ambassadors for heaven, co-laborers with Christ. So as I close this morning, the other night, um, Ross and I were out prayer walking and, and we walked right down to the edge of town where we could really just, there's just a field between us and the, the flare at Grangemouth. And it was so bright, it was roaring, it was loud, it was obvious, it was lighting up the whole sky. And even when we got back to Bowness, you could still see it. Even though you couldn't see the flame, you could see the flaring. Uh, and Ross actually prayed as we were walking towards it, Lord, Cause that fire in us. Stoke that fire in us again. And I, I realised 
church, that we are called to be that light in this town, that we're called to be noisy, to be roaring with power, that we're caused to be visible from every place in town. And it is time to arise and shine in the true identity, in strength and confidence, knowing that we are his. You know, what the, what the church, sorry, what the town needs now It's not love, sweet love. It is a church that is united, visible, vocal and active and powerfully demonstrates Christ's love. A church that lives in the power of Christ's love, that that people recognise us because we have that love powerfully for one another. This town needs a church that stands and shines in confident humility. Confident humility, not shrinking away, but confidently moving forward in humility. A church that kneels in earnest, unceasing prayer. A church that recognises that she is here for such a time as this. Look, church, we're not called to politely excuse ourselves from society. We're not called to, to, to leave all of this stuff to the professional ministers, to the professional Christians. We are here to pray in earnest and preach Christ in power right here and right now. So arise, shine, your light has come. The light of the world, let him shine in our midst. Don't hide him, church. And God was really challenging me whilst out praying recently. I think Jess put this in the group and I'm closing with this. That that he said, how long are you prepared to do this without seeing fruit? Like, how long am I prepared to keep going out onto the streets and praying with, with no seeming changes or things happening? How long would I keep that up for? How, how far are you prepared to go? Like bloody knees, broken hearts, empty accounts, tired voices. How far are we prepared to go, church, to see actual, lasting, wonderful change in this town? What would you say to his challenge? I don't know about you, but here I am, Lord. I'm in your hands and I'm all in. Amen.